Um, thanks for the reminder. My sticky note is not helping me. Um, so yeah, so if you are a tag owner or an array owner that has uploaded data to the database, and we have gone through a data push. So like I said, by mid-May, you will receive an email. That's kind of like a general email and telling you to go to your project page on the website to download your data extracts, which look like this. So you would go into your project page, open your data extraction file tab, and it will pull up a whole list. So this is for, um, only an acoustic array project. So you have a couple different um, types of files. You have a qualified detection file, which is project, which is tags that have been matched to tags in the database. You have Sentinel tags, which are like test tags, transmitters that have been detected from the database. And then you have unqualified detections, which are tags that your receiver picked up but we don't know who the owner is yet because those tags have either yet been added to the database or are false detections. So a qualified one would look something like this, which you can't now see. Um, so it gives you a whole slew of data, which OTN will be talking about tomorrow on how best to open these, because eventually Excel will not be the correct way, because they're going to be huge files down the road. But you'll see your project's code. Um, you'll see the date and time that that detection happened. You'll see the tag number, um, which was detected. And then you can scroll, you'll see who that detection belongs to. So you won't be getting um, species necessarily, so you won't know what animal this is, but you will have a contact named. So this tag um, belonged to Chuck Stents. So you could send Chuck Stents an email saying, hey, um, I see that you, I picked up your, some of your fish, you know, could you tell me more about your project? And you know, what are you working on? I'm curious about what species I'm picking up and so on and so forth. I don't think, and then you'll see, you know, so our projects within the, within the ACT network sort of look like this. There are proj and then a number. And then you'll see that this says fact.ncobia. Um, so you know that those detections actually came from a fact based project or Spoiler similarly, OTN project is an OTN um, based project. So that would be the type of extract you get for an array. Yeah, and, and I'll just note here too that one of the things we're working with RPS on is to change that project, like 57 or whatever it was, to actually say the project identification code, but that's been a, a quirk of the website we haven't quite solved yet. Yes, and then similarly, if you have a tag project, you would go for your data extract, you go to your project, which for you, it could be the same exact same project. We just have our separate. Um, so again, data extraction files. Now this would be for tags. So you would get, um, it will say match detections and then the year. And you can pull up all of the detections of where your tag went with, from that year, which would look something like this. Um, so you would see your project what species from that project. And then you can tell which project detected it. So um, project 61, which is our circ array detected this tag. And you can see that it was detected at the FACT network and which different projects that was. All the good information you'll wanna know, but then if you keep scrolling, um, you will see um, a citation or contact information of people that own that array. So again, you could reach out to that group of people and you know work on a collaboration, or I can you know send you hook you up with them and give you some contact information if need be. So again, similar to what the other um, data extraction looked like. There is also um, a handy. I think I have kind of available. 
OTN has created a detection key that will be sort of integrated into the detection extracts in this next round, which basically defines everything for you. So you can understand what all of those crazy columns are actually telling you if it's not clear. Um, so that will be a helpful resource for you. Plus you can always ask questions. Okay. So is there yeah. any more questions on like that aspect sort of working backwards? And Kim, I just threw the link up for the OTN edition of that of that data extraction key. We just have it up on the website. I know you guys are going to have it soon, but. Cool. All right, so now we'll kind of start from the beginning. Um, so when you are, when you want to upload data to the database, we have templates um, that we modeled from OTN and that fact uses something similar to upload your data to the website in like a concise, manner that is uniform and helps sort of keep everything aligned and then also course corresponds to how you would perhaps analyze the data later on. Did anyone have any specific questions on like the data templates and how they work? Okay. So this um, is an example of the instrument deployment template. So all of the templates can be downloaded from the website or I can send them to you via email or both. Um, and each of the templates has this data dictionary in the first tab. So it kind of tells you what exactly we're looking for in each of the columns and an example of what that might look like. And then the second tab is the actual data. Um, nice car alarm. Um, so this is what the template looks like. And you would put, you know, type your data in and then submit it. Um, so OTN array, that would be your project code number, which if you don't know, you can leave blank and I will fill that in. The station name or station number can be um, pretty much anything but um, integers. So chess pay, or it can be, or it can be a num just numbers or a name, doesn't have to be just numbers. Um, the deployment date and time would be its year, month, date, capital T, and then hour, month, and seconds. And that preferably is in UTC time format. Deploy, Latin long, that's sort of self-explanatory. Um, bottom depths, riser lengths, instrument, instrument depths. This information helps determine where your receiver is in the water column. That way, someone, you know, if you're working out in the ocean where it's a lot deeper, it could be advantageous for someone to know, oh, you know, my shark was detected in the top of the water column or at the bottom. It might help for analysis down the road. Instrument model number is uh, what type of instrument are you working with? Are you working with a VR2, a VR2 AR, and so on? Then the serial number, the code set. So what map format are you working in? So that helps us determine, you know, your uh, receiver being up to date. If there's a transmitter associated with each of your receivers, that's where that would go along with the deployment information. Um, if you're working with an AR, then that information goes in the next two columns. Um, and then I think the, the thing that people seem to be mostly tripped up on is recovery. So you've deployed your receiver on such and such a date at such and such a time. It's best if you've recorded that because then we can tell exactly when your receiver was put in the water versus when it was sitting on the shelf or on the boat. And then recovery um, does not necessarily mean I've recovered my receiver and I've taken it home. Recovery can just mean I've taken it out of the water and I've downloaded it and I've put it back in. So like each, each line of, of this file is kind of like a download event. So I've deployed it and then I've downloaded it 
slash recovered it, you know, at such a such and such a time, you know, many months or years later. And then if you redeployed it three minutes after you download it, then you could start a new line. Okay, it went in, back in the water at 115. Um, and then there's a, you know, another column for download. Uh, did you download it as well, date and time, and then file name if you would choose. Any kind of questions on that? Or anything OTN wants to elaborate on? Okay. There was one question came about uh, using the citations from the detection extracts. I don't know if once we can revisit that once they're happy with this. Okay. Um, so the other um, type of tag detection or other type of metadata that the website or database ingests is obviously your tag detections. So this would be um, the template for that. And again, it's on the website or I can send you an email. And it takes a lot of information, but the one thing to remember is that this information is private to you and it's not shared across everybody or sent out during your tag detections. Um, it is only available to you unless you've obviously made it stated otherwise that you've made it public. So even though it sounds, it kind of seems like you're sharing everything, it's only meant as a record for you and to help you with a formatted organized analysis later on. Um, so it takes things like, you know, type of tag, company you bought it from, serial numbers, um, serial number, and code spaces and code IDs are very important because it helps us distinguish when you, know, you have tags, when numbers kind of start repeating from say Novacy, you can have it, it's identified by the serial number and code space rather than just having like one identifying number. It identifies by both. So it helps distinguish those if things ever start to overlap. Um, is it internal? What's the, what's the life of the tag? Who tagged it? Who owns it? That kind of is all very self-explanatory. Uh, was it a hatchery fish or was, did you catch it in the wild? Where did it originate from potentially or where did you catch it? Um, some length, weight, data. Um, anything green is required for you to upload um, to an extent. So the text in, in white is not necessary, but it is, if you do those things, it's helpful for you to have, then you'll have everything in one place rather than kind of scattered all over your desktop and computer. Um, where did you release it? And that uh, harvest date uh, just means if you tagged a fish in May, but then you recaptured it in June, removed the tag, and then decided, oh, well, there's still two years left on this tag, I'm going to reuse it, then you would want to put the date that that tag was harvested before you could, um, before you reused it. That way we can figure out, oh, it was this, this tag was no longer in this striped bass, now it was in a sturgeon or something like that. And lots of other data you can add in. Most of this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Kim, can you uh, address something? If we use a test tag, does that get incorporated into your database? We had one out for a few weeks and we plan on putting more out, you know, to get it, range tests done? It does, yes. Those would go um, on the deployment data form. So we would wanna know um, information about the tag and then when that tag when and where that tag was placed and then when and where, you know, when and when it was then pulled back out. But it, would, it wouldn't be associated with a species. It would just be, you know, a, a fixed location. It's not moving around. Right. 
Right, so you would wanna put it um, on the instrument deployment metadata form. So similar to kind of treating it like it was a receiver in a way. If that makes sense. Yeah, and, and Joe, that, that way, like if, if your wave glider cruises over that site while you have that test tag deployed, it'll be able to match those, those things as well. Like it'll know if I'm, I don't know, Naomi's looking at me like I'm crazy. But, right, right, right. but you know, so that'll help your wave glider know that that was not a fish tag, it was a, a Sentinel tag. Right. Right. Nice. That's, we, we, we've already had that situation. What, it went over our receivers, our AR receivers. And so those aren't fish, those are yeah, so, tags on the receivers. So for your AR, you would just, from the sticker on the AR, you'd write down the transmitter value in that transmitter column that I think uh, Kim has on line 17 there. Right. If it was a separate tag, like a, a V16 or a V9 or whatever, then you would want to put in that model because it's not, because it's separate. But if it's, if it's integrated into the receiver, like an AR or a TX, then you right. can just put in the transmitter value, but like the full value with the code space and everything. Yeah, this is tricky. Okay, we'll make sure. I think that we've already done it that way. I'll confirm with Caitlin, who's there. Yeah, I, I think you did. I think I remember working with you because we haven't had too many um, other transmitters go in. So it was kind of new for me as well. But we can definitely double check those because I, I think I remember talking to you and Caitlin about some of that. Okay. And if you're if you're dipping a test tag, like when you deploy your glider or whatnot, then you would want to write down when you do that dip as well. We, we, yeah, we did that on recovery last time. So yes, I mean, that's that can be confusing. It's not a fish. That's our test tag. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want that to be, it won't confuse us, but it, it, if anybody's receiver was in that area, they might think there was a fish. Right. So by uploading any of that information, then those would be kind of separated out from animal detections. Right. And it would be more clear, even in your own data, that'd be less work you'd have to clean up afterwards. So that was, that was a good question. And there any other? Well, there's yeah. another form for gliders and I, I used it this time and I hope I did it right. But um, you've got a, a glider deployment lat long and then you have a separate telemetry file, right? Yes. For glider. And then, yes. And then, and then we got a receiver on the glider that has its own tag detections uh which we download at the end of the mission and they have a time uh stamp that you have to somehow marry to the telemetry data and i'm just wondering you know in our wave glider we use we we, we get a um, a different kind of data form downloaded that has the exact time that the tag was detected and the exact Latin long when it was detected, but I don't think that's going to be possible with the way you have the data forms for gliders because you're going to only know the time the tag was detected from the receiver in UTC, but the Latin long uh, of the wave glider will be, you know, somewhere different uh, at the time of detection. You'll you'll have a time before or after or a location before or after the tag detection but not necessarily at the tag detection. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, maybe I'll let Naomi, I, know I saw Ryan was on, but I don't know if he still is. So Joe, we have um, a, a method, we call it active tracking, where we uh, take the telemetry file and the receiver file, and we're able to link those up um, and create uh, essentially temporary stations every time there's a detection by your mobile device, whether it's a glider or a boat that's doing a float or a number of similar scenarios. Um, every time there's a detection, we're able to create a station for that detection point um, because 
it's the same as with the receiver that the detection is happening at the location of the receiver, whether it's on a glider or on a mooring. Um, and then we have the times linked together from both the receiver and the, let's say the glider telemetry file. And so the detection extract that is returned has those times linked together. Okay, that that's kind of what we were doing ourselves, but you have that built into your, uh, what do you call it, extraction? Into the process. Extraction yeah. reports. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Okay. So, because one of the things we just encountered is uh, we changed the telemetry rate on our wave glider while it was at sea to save power. So sometimes it was every five minutes, that's the sort of default, but then you can change it to every 20 minutes or whatever if you're trying to save battery power. And thus you don't know, the wave glider is not always five, it's, you're not getting a telemetry report every five minutes, you're getting it every 20 minutes. So yeah. if detection happens during that time, you have to adjust for that. But it sounds to me like you haven't figured out. So I think that falls into the same kind of idea as there being like a sphere or a cylinder of detection where the tag is within the range of the receiver. It's not necessarily right immediately beside the receiver. It's just somewhere within the range, right? Right. So there is that margin of error that falls into everything that we're doing with acoustic telemetry. Right. And so unless your glider is moving at an incredible rate, if it's on a, a powerboat or something, this would become an issue with your telemetry rate. But I think that probably is, is um, handled by that assumed um, variability in the location of the tag, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think basically you're just interpolating between positions of the telemetry file using the time stamp. I'm guessing it, it does, I mean, does it factor in the glider rate of travel? Because we, the, the glider speed does vary a little bit, but it's around one knot, but it varies depending on the currents and waves. No, it's just linear interpolation. Yeah, okay. Fine, that's good. All right, I'm not worried about it now. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, you were you were our first uh, wave glider project, so yeah. it's definitely been a learning experience for me. Well, I, again, if if there's anything I didn't do right, let me know. But I I figured it out and it seemed to work okay. Uh, our our big our big problem with our wave glider was it detected tags, our tags, which was great, but there's something called WGMS, the Wave Glider Management System, didn't somehow capture some of the tag detections while it was at sea. So we detected fish we didn't know about until later when we got it back on shore. And we saw that too with our OTN glider, Joe. Yeah? Yeah. We had a VMT and a VR2C on the, our Wave Glider and they had totally different detection events that the other didn't see. So what is going on there, do you know? Not a clue. We, we thought a little bit about like the, the angle of each of the listening uh, apparatuses on the two, but they weren't significantly different. Um, we had the VR2C on a tow fish and then the, the VMT was connected directly to the sled, um, but the VMT was picking up stuff the VR2C didn't. Matt might have an insight. I think you were, you were playing around in glider land, Matt, weren't you? Yeah, that's why I raised my hand. Um, so we had, we did... We, there's a paper out that we published. Matt Oliver was the lead, and uh, I'll put the citation in the in the chat um, once I dig it up. But we looked at comparisons between a VMT and the integrated VR2Cs, both top and bottom, and found there was differences. And I think what we found was that there was there was a donut effect for the VR2Cs where they weren't where the VR the VMT maybe was more sensitive. To closer fish, and the the tags that were too close kind of overpowered, and there may have been some kind of echo or something going on for the VR two Cs. But there was differences um, on our on our slocum as well, and we also talk about some environmental parameters that may have affected it um, with with that as well. I'll, I'll put that in the in the chat. I think I found it, but you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, That looks right. Yeah, that's it. 
Now I'm going to have to read it and find out what we saw too. I hadn't, I hadn't had a chance to read it through yet, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, it was interesting. We didn't expect it and we, we took some opportunity. And so we also in that, if you don't want to read it just for the highlights, we put a transmitter on one glider and we're listening for it on the other glider, right? So we had two gliders. So we had an exact known location for each receiver and the transmitter, which is kind of rare if you have moving, like a moving animal, you don't really know where it is. Um, so that was a, that's a little teaser. So I encourage everybody to read it, I guess. <laughs> that sounds like a solid week of field work there. That'd be a lot of fun. I used to be a glider guy in the past life, but I moved on before this thing came out. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I pulled it up and I'm going to read it. Um, it's interesting. Our, our problem is a little bit different, though, and I'm not sure I made it clear. But we have a VR2C receiver on the sled, on the glider sub, and it's recording tags. I mean, it's got an internal storage, right? But it doesn't get transmitted via WGMS in every case. That's what I was kind well, of... That, yeah, that's... Um... You got to be really super careful with that, um, and we we dealt with that with the with with Vemco originally when it was Vemco. Um, if it depends on when it's pulled and when the power is cycled to the instrument. Mm -hmm. So if if you have the polling rate set at thirty minutes, but it but it, the power is cut off at twenty minutes, you may lose twenty minutes of detections if you have a power cycle. Um, and we, unfortunately, early on, had to power cycle our science bay, including our VR2, um, when we surfaced to have because the glider was was going haywire um, with a different sensor. Um, we got most of those detections back, but we had to really go into the receiver physically and and download the data off of that with you know some pigtail wires and things like that. So, so they could be on there and you'll notice them by, you'll have a, you have a detection count and make sure that the detection count is going up at the same rate as you're receiving the detections that are transmitted to you over satellite or whatever, or however you're getting it. Yeah, I mean, that's basically how I found out we had an, an issue. It's happened more than once. Yeah. And, you know, our wave glider is, I guess you're talking about a slocum or some other buoyancy glider because Ours, I, I don't know that there's any way I can change the polling cycle or the power cycle on our wave glider. I, you know, I brought this up and I put in a ticket to Liquid Robotics and they haven't figured it out either. They think it's Vemco's problem and Vemco says it's Liquid Robotics problem. But I, there, it's something like what you're describing in the wave glider situation where the, the surface computer the CNC computer is doing something when a tag is detected and it's not it's not getting that in real time and sending it to WGMS. It's fortunately on the VR2C. So when I get it back on land, I can connect the cable to it and, and see all those detections. But we had like two of our four fish we detected the last mission were not reported over WGMS. And I don't understand why. Um, but it has to do, it's got to have something to do with this power, you know, uh, cycle or the polling cycle of the surface computer. And I don't know what it is. So any advice anybody can offer us here? <laughs> well, I don't know what, what documents or what version you're looking at. Uh, we were doing this way back in 2013 to 2014. And I know everything's been updated since then. Um, but also they... Anovasi has the new, right? They have a new cable receiver that's not the VR2C. It's a, it's, I forget what it's called. So that may serve and function differently as well. Um, but if you want that, you're going to have to pay for it, I guess, right? We're in the middle of integration uh, engineering tests for that. I think we've ordered one. Um, so don't let them charge you for it. Um, <laughs> so we'll let you know how we go, I guess, with that. I haven't looked in on that in a minute, but I can maybe ping someone right now to find out if there's any big snags. That's good. I'm I'm hoping if I can get funding, put one of those on a Remus vehicle. We're going to integrate it with our SV3. Joe, you guys run an SV2 or SV3? We're using an SV2. 
Okay. So, yeah, our first one was like that too. Are you not using an SV2 anymore? We still got the SV2. It still does the the towfish thing. Um, I haven't. I mean, I haven't seen any any phantom detections that didn't come over the wire. But I remember the time that we deployed a VMT with the pinger still on. And so the VR2C was very good at hearing our VMT and telling us all about it. And I think we racked up a thousand dollars in uh, satellite charges before we went out and grabbed the thing again. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know if we've been looking too closely for phantom detections that are only on the cable, but I know we do download them after they come home, even though they've been transmitting live, we'd still download and get the, the files off it. Yeah. So just to be clear, we did upload the, um, to Matos's uh, database, the uh, the full downloaded at the end of the mission detection list in time. Yes, yeah, you you'll be getting those at that in the next extract that come out. But we did we don't. There's no place for us to upload the WGMS uh, records anyhow. So we just keep those internally and use them for our publications and maps and things. But. But I have to modify that list to add any additional tags we detected the, with the VR2C at the end of the mission. Uh, so anyhow, you have the complete data at Matos. Uh, it's just, there's no lat long associated with that, right? Because it's, you do that interpolation. So that's, that solves my, you answered all my questions. Great. Um. Yeah, so the takeaway from that conversation is that we do take glider data, wave and or slocum for anybody else out there that is using wave or slocum gliders, they can um, get uploaded to the website and go into the database and come out in your data extractions like your other receivers. So that is also happening. Um, we have about 30 minutes or so left. So I will show you kind of more of like the website and what's happening on there for those that haven't really worked with it yet. Um, so when you go to the website, this is what you're seeing and I'm not logged in. So we can look at um, what we were talking about earlier with pub, uh, projects that are public versus non-public. We'll see how long this loads. Well, so currently what you're looking at um, are all of the receivers in the whole database that have public access. So there's actually quite a few of them. Um, so you can click on the receiver and you can find some very basic, so as a person in the general world who does, is not a user, can click on them and see some basic um, information and have some contact information about the receiver. And you can only zoom in um, so far. So you wouldn't actually get to see like the actual pinpointed location um, of them. So this would be if you are not a database user and what you would be, what you would get if you uh, were a researcher who released their data to the public. But then if you logged in, Kim, or can, can you just... Kim, can you go back to that just for a second? Sorry. Um, so for, for public tags, so th this is one of the things we're working on RPS to improve, just, just so you all are aware. Can you click on the tag thing, Kim? So right, right now, if a tag is public, you have to kind of know what its number is um, to see it, which is a total pain in the butt. You don't get information about what project it's associated with or anything. So we're, we're working with RPS to have a similar list to the receiver list so that you'll be able to show the tag locations by project um, at some time in the, you know, sometime in the future. But we're gonna try to make that look similar to the way the receivers show. Yeah, and like right now, um, this general list over here is a mix of like tagging projects and receiver projects, whereas you know, having the tag show up as receivers isn't very helpful. So that will also kind of change. To be to happen. Um, so, if you were going to uh, go to log in, you won't see that because that's me as an admin. You would see something like this. Um, 
some basic information that honestly is outdated and needs to be redone. Um, there's the submit data tab. This is where you would go to submit any of your raw me metadata. So you would pull open a list of your projects. This in theory will only show you your projects, but since I'm logged in as admin, I see all of them. Um, and then the type of data you're uploading, which this is helpful for you because it's kind of gives you a quick um, snippet of like what kind of data you want to open in your um, whole log of data that you've uploaded. But honestly, this doesn't, if you accidentally select the wrong one, it's not going to do anything bad. Um, and then you would hit upload. And then eventually you would get like a green success bar saying that it uploaded. You can upload a batch of files. Like if you're uploading a bunch of VRL files, um, you can upload a bunch of those at one time. However, it will take longer. So be patient is all I can say, and it should work. Um, I should add that as well as the raw metadata, as far as deployment data or tag metadata, you also do need to then upload the detection files, which we prefer the VRL files over CSV files because we want them raw and unedited. Um, obviously, sometimes in a CSV, when you're opening Excel, some data can get lost. So we wouldn't, that can screw up the detections and be inaccurate. So the VRL files are definitely better. And that also gives us a little bit more information as far as like receiver health and we can calculate time drift that has happened um, during the receiver's deployment if we have the VRL files. So now you've uploaded some data and you wanna check it out in your project. So we'll go to our array project. So if you had a project in there, this is what your sort of landing page would look like. Um, some basic information, a link to maybe your public data that's published or your URL. Um, we're gonna add some more opportunities for you to add more URLs. Right now, I think you're only allowed one, but we're gonna add on to that. The project files tab is the list of everything you've ever uploaded. So as you can see, we've been uploading for a while and it's all kind of sorted by the type of file and the year it was uploaded. This would also give you the opportunity to say, oh no, my computer crashed and I've lost everything. Well, now you have an archive of it and you can download it um, directly from the website. And this works either tag data or receiver data. It doesn't matter, they all work the same. And as I talked about earlier, detection extracts are located in the next tab and receiver or tag, again, is a list. And um, they're sort of listed by file name, but then also upload date. So after every data extract, um, if it's from 2013, it's not gonna be a new file. Um, data just keeps getting added to the same file. So that same file is going to keep growing and growing. So if this upload date is says like May 1st, 2021, then it is likely that it is a new uploaded file. But if it hasn't changed from the last data extract, then it's likely that there's no new information um, in that file. You can see some of these dates different just because what's been updated or what hasn't. Um, to edit your project is fairly straightforward. You can edit any of the details that you need to along the way, except for your project code for obvious reasons. Um, and then we get into the project permissions. So in this project, these are specific people that have been allowed access. And you can see that you can allow different people, different details. So you could allow someone to only edit project details or only submit data or only download data or able to do everything. So that is where you would go in to do that. And then project visibility, this is the easy one check button that you would need to hit to make it publicly available. So it's simply check 
and save for an on check. Um, any of those kinds of questions? I think I saw the chat growing as I was reading or talking. Just more glider questions. Okay, that's fine. I'm not good with those answers. I'm learning about that stuff. Um, yeah, let's see, what else? So if you are logged in and you went to the map, Obviously my map will look much different than your map because I've got access to everything, but this is then where you would be able to um, look at all of the receivers that are either public or that you have access to or projects that you're collaborating with. Um, and that would pull that up here. This is also where you could type in one of your tag numbers, which I forgot to write one down as an example, and you'll be able to see everywhere that tag has been detected on your receivers or a location where it's been detected on someone else's receiver. But this is only within the ACT network. So even though our database is connected to OTN and FACT and other nodes, when you're working on the website, it's only pulling data from our database, not from other networked databases. Um, similarly, there's a search feature. So if you uh, wanted to take a quick look to see if your tags were anywhere, you could select some dates, put in a list of tag codes and um, search, and it would bring you up, I think a, an Excel file or a CSV file to download. And then that would give you a whole list of detections. Again, getting pulled out of the database, our database, not FACT or OTN databases, only the ACT database. But it can be a quick reference if you're working on something or need to create a report real quick and you know you've uploaded data for a while, that's something that you could be able to do. Kim, there's a question there from Patrick uh, McGrath. Um, how soon after I upload a VRL will it show up under my project files? Is that with the data push or is it sooner? It will be automatically. Um, so I can show you my side of so it's sort of side of things. So as an admin, when you upload a file, I will get a list like this. So you can see had Caitlin had uploaded a file back in March. Um, so that is when this is the part where you upload to, the, to this website and then I download from the website and then run it through. Um, some QA, QC scripts, and then put it into the database. So at this stage, um, your file is not yet in the database, but it's kind of in this like holding pattern. So at this point, you would still be able, once you've uploaded it, you would still be able to see it in your record of files. Um, it is just that I haven't processed it into the database so far. Um, this is just a list of every single file that's ever been uploaded into the database, um, which I now have the ability to delete. So if we have uploaded something and realized there was an error and we wanted to fix it so that your records are more accurate, then we can retroactively change those now. Count requests. Oh, look, I have a count request. Um, and then, you know, a list of our accounts. So that's kind of what my side looks like as far as that. So again, once you've uploaded your data to the website, that does not mean it goes into the database. Um, and you can, again, see your files right away in your record, but you will not be able to see your, your receivers or tags on a map until I put it in the database because the website pulls from the database. If that answers multiple questions. Anything else? Um, I think that is a pretty rough um, go
go at what it is to upload files. So is there anything else that people want to talk about? More stuff about data extractions, what happens during the data push, anything like that. Naomi, is there anything else you think that I've missed on? I think you've oh. done often. Did you touch on raw versus edited uh, VRL files and mm -hmm. why raws are important? I did briefly. Yeah, that's the that's one I always try not to forget because of how important it is. Yeah. We got I Bill just... Hoffman on the line here. If you want to go to Bill. Yes, I do hey, see Bill has a question. Hey, Kim, quick question. Um, on the data extraction files. So mm -hmm. the unqualified detections um, in the past with the, you know, with the old act with the Dropbox, if we had unknown detections, we would take the VRL, send them to Vemco and they would find the people that owned them. And then we'd go through email and get them the data um, with the unqualified detections. Now, Matos, how is that handled? Is it still our responsibility to track people down? Um. So far, I have not done anything with trying to track um, tag owners down just because we have, I mean, 6.3 million of them go undetected. So I would say if you really want to know, it's probably either worth reaching out to Vemco or reaching out to me and I can assist you. Um, I've definitely helped some researchers go through the Act Dropbox and look for tags and try to pull some of the ones that have yet to, been up, yet to be uploaded from there to map them that way. Um, so I guess you can ask me and we can discuss it, okay. but yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful that if there's a researcher out there, that's not a part of Matos or act and they're looking for their data, they'll figure out how to get here eventually. And then they'll get their data. I mean, it, as you know, it can take weeks to track some of these people down and get them their data. And sometimes they don't even really care. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would say sort of my approach to getting tags into this database has been, oh, such, such and such a project has uploaded data and has a bunch of unqualified tags. So then I've looked at that list, went to the Act Dropbox, oh, there are so-and-so's tags. So let me reach out to that person and say, hey, look, you know, we've got this database and kind of going it from that angle. Um, you know, definitely starting with our already started Act membership to get those tags into the database first to help min uh, mitigate some of the unqualified detections. And I, I think we're probably nearing the point too, where we've got a lot of the, you know, a lot of the active projects are in here, certainly not all of them, but a lot of them. This is probably a, about the time that we started to see people who were using the FACT database start to drop out of the old ACT Dropbox list. Um, there was you know, a series of people who sort of started sending around emails. This is the last time I'm sending out data after this, join the FACT network. Um, and you know, so for, for now, I think a, you know, a lot of people in our region are still emailing stuff out to folks. And, but you know, we're, we're nearing the point where you know, I think the, the majority of the detections for current tags and and new projects are going to be coming through the database and we'll keep working towards, you know, facilitating the old kind of data exchange where, where we have to, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to, to get more projects in here so that, that pretty much all of the data sharing can happen this way. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And like I said this morning, uh, I'm going to, I plan to do another Dropbox kind of update this summer. So I do have a few tags that people, they were uploading to the database and then they asked me about Dropbox. So since their tags basically were already formatted, I said I could just upload them right in. So I do have a few people um, that are gonna be updating Dropbox already, but I know as a whole, I think that number has sort of died down. I know I've had comments of, well, if I'm using the database, why would I use Dropbox? So I think there is already starting to see, you know, the changeover from people using Dropbox and just, doing it one time rather than multiple times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely works for us. Yeah, and, and as Matt said earlier this morning or this afternoon, I don't remember when, 
but I, I'm here as a resource. So feel free to, you know, reach out with questions and I can certainly part of my time is to take your data sheets and help you format them to get them into the database. Um, Cause obviously it's a very big undertaking and well, you guys are busy doing, doing the research and I have the time to work on some of those. So feel free to reach out and we can start those conversations. Okay. Thanks. And I, I think that, you know, that goes certainly for, for other folks too. And, you know, what we're part of the approach to that has been trying to, you know, if you have been doing telemetry work for a long time, you know, we're trying to get active tags in first as the, the top priority or new projects, you know, and then can start to work through the backlog of the, the history of your tagging efforts. Um, but, you know, towards the, the, the question about, you know, do we have to keep doing it the old way and do it this way? You know, we're trying to prioritize getting everyone's current projects up and running in this system, and then we can go back and add in some of the legacy stuff uh, as time allows. Yeah, and I'm also, if there's anyone that, I mean, I, I walked through this stuff pretty quickly. So if there's anyone that, you know, either you personally or you know somebody that wants some help, I can certainly set up some one-on-one -on -one time and we can, you know, do a Zoom or Teams or however your preferred platform is, and we can walk through some of this stuff one-on-one. -on -one. 